Well, I greet you this morning in the name of the Lord. I appreciate Pastor Peter inviting me. Thank you for the invitation, uh, Upper Kings Clear. And uh, Fredericton is my home. I have my wife and I, Donna. Uh, we have four adult children, three of whom are married, and we have four grandchildren. And uh, it's been an exciting year. We'll, we will have had, by December, we will have had three of our children, or we would have had three grandchildren uh, born within one year. So it's uh, going to be busy again in the Gosman household. My aunt and uncle, uh, Chester and Aunt Rita, uh, are part here. So it's uh, nice to be uh, among family and also among family in the Lord. My wife and I uh, traveled to her birth home in Kenya uh, when I finished in seminary, and so Pastor Peter and Donna uh, both have that in common, and uh, Pastor Peter, although he was uh, further along in seminary, uh, he and I knew each other ever since the early 90s, mid-90s, uh, in the seminary days, and of course, he and Donna have the Kenya connection. This very familiar story that we just ended up seeing depicted on video, it's kind of like an oasis. It's kind of like something that you might put in your pocket because you consider it to be uh, a, a lucky charm. It is something that it's a nugget of value. It kind of stands alone, this storm on the Sea of Galilee, but from it, we can glean uh, what I'm calling teachings in the tempest. Uh, and it is a powerful reminder of what is available to us in the midst of the inevitable tempest and storms in life. It's amazing how the most difficult things in life come to us summarized in just a few words. I think of a few crises in my own life that have come. Uh, the first would have been in my first church, and the screaming mother on the phone simply said, he's dead. And young Peter was, by mistake, uh, playing in his friend's house and was uh, shot in the chest when his 10-year-old friend pulled out a twenty-two. And what do boys do when they have guns? They pull the trigger. And uh, young Peter was shot dead. Uh, summarized just in two words, he's dead. I remember in uh, one of, well back 15, almost 20 years ago, in one of uh, the first churches that I was pastoring, uh, the board, I was senior pastor at a fairly large church of 250 to 300. And uh, the uh, assistant pastor thought he wanted my job. And the board came to me after a year or two, and they said, you're fired. Uh, the summation in such short, concise words. Uh, we had reconcil reconciled by the time we had left, and uh, things were smoothed over. But it was quite a crisis. It was a tempest, as it were. And then uh, almost a couple of years ago, and now, my mom called me as the eldest in the family and said, Dad has died. And that was a short summation of another tempest. I say these things because the raging tempest is inevitable. The raging tempest is inevitable. We've all gone through difficult times and Either we're going through one right now, or we will go through one very shortly, because the tempests in life are inevitable. But, even though they are inevitable through Christ, they are not invincible. And so, from this particular calming of the storm, this tempest that is tempered, Jesus teaches us a number of things that first to his disciples that we can now apply to ourselves. And I want 
to share this text out of Luke chapter 8, verses 22 to 25, from the New Living Translation. It says this, One day Jesus said to his disciples, Let's cross over to the other side of the lake. So they got in a boat and started out. As they sailed across, Jesus settled down for a nap. Soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water, and they were in real danger. The disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we're going to drown. When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and the raging waves. Suddenly the storm stopped, and all was calm. And what I want you to do is I want you to think about the storm or the tempest in which you find yourself today. And what I'm saying to you is that suddenly Jesus can stop and make things calm. And you see the parallel, the physical storm and the emotional storm, the physical storm that you might be going through in your particular tempest. And verse 25 concludes like this, Then he asked them, where is your faith? The disciples were terrified and amazed. I love that contrast. Terrified and amazed. Who is this man? They asked each other. When he gives a command, even the wind and waves obey him. What teaching did Jesus, did the disciples learn in the tempest? And I submit to you that the first principle, the first teaching in the temple that Jesus taught his disciples that we can apply to our own tempest, these inevitable tempests, is that Jesus replaced their limited teaching of earth with the abundance of heaven. In other words, there was a fundamental change in both the resources that would be available to them and the rewards or the motives for which they were working or they would serve. Jesus said, I'm going to make you fishers of men. Come and follow me. And sometimes the rewards for which we fight and we strive in this world are not properly motivated. Maybe they're for us. But Jesus wants to give us resources that are far more valuable. And he wants to give us rewards and wants us to, to work and serve with a purpose far greater and for rewards that are eternal. So the Bible, to support this particular principle, Jesus replaced their limited teachings on earth with the abundance of heaven, is this. He says, let's go to the other side of the lake. So Jesus is setting them up. He knows what he's going to do. So they got in the boat and they started out. And as they sailed, Jesus settled down for a nap, setting them up. But soon a fierce storm came down on the lake. The boat was filling with water. They were in real danger. This is not some metaphorical. This is not. This is a real life threatening situation, the gospel writer says. And the disciples went and woke him up, shouting, Master, Master, we are going to drown. Why are they going to drown? Why? Because the resources that they had come to depend upon were limited. And Jesus wants to replace them with his resources. A little bit of a background. Not all the men were fishermen. Peter and Andrew, brothers. James and John, also brothers. They were good enough as fishermen to build a business. One of the other gospel writers say, imply that it was somewhat lucrative enough for their hired servants and their multiple fleet of boats. They left all that behind. In another place, Peter says, we have left everything to follow you, Jesus. And Jesus says, anyone who has left homes and lands and friends and family, implying that, yes, I understand that indeed you have left 
much behind. So the disciples left all that, but there were other occupations. But the twelve had grown up around, in and around the Sea of Galilee, the villages in and around this great sea. And they spent most of their time, Jesus in Capernaum uh, spent most of his time there. And everyone knew how to fish, everyone knew how to sail, how to survive the stormy seas. And yet, for all their knowledge and skill as fishermen and as sailors, they could not save themselves from this divinely orchestrated storm. Or they could not save themselves from what Jesus in his sovereignty allowed to pass. You know, Jesus is, inter- and, and is, is teaching them an important lesson that every follower of Jesus must encounter. Human wisdom isn't enough to get you through life. You know, ever since I was a boy, I took cooking classes. My mother, at 10 years old, would put me in cooking classes. Often, she would, I remember learning how to roll fish, shad, and salmon in a mixture of spices and flour, or sometimes uh, cornmeal. I learned how to make shepherd's pie. I learned how to make... uh, roll out the dough. I learned how to put in the, the apple pie filling and spices and things like that. I felt comfortable around the kitchen. And then I got married. And uh, my wife had a different style uh, of cooking. She was kind of left brain cooking, read from the cookbook, Betty Crocker cookbook, and I was kind of right brain cooking Uh, reading from the uh, internal uh, motivation of my heart, what I had had learned. And we were at odds in that first couple years of marriage. But I had to make a decision in order for there to be peace in the home. I had to survive and I had to surrender cooking Neville Gosman's style and embrace the time-tested success of the world of recipes. It was going to be Neville or better Betty, Betty Crocker. In a way, God has asked us to look and to live to a different set of rules. To cook, as it were, by instinct, needs to be put aside to cook based on that which has been revealed and written. The Bible says this, His divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through our knowledge of Him who has called us by His own glory and goodness. Through these, He has given us His very great and precious promises so that through them you may participate in the divine nature. You know, the question is this, And it's a difficult truth to admit that Jesus required a fisherman, and here's the irony, to emphasize the difference in our need to trust in God's wisdom instead of our own. Irony is used to make the point, the contrast between what a fisherman should know about a storm and Jesus who is the carpenter. What good is it to be in a storm with a carpenter when your boat is filling, is filled with veteran fishermen? What the carpenter knows is irrelevant. And we need fisherman knowledge to get us out of the storm. That's what the disciples had. The irony, so as to emphasize the abundance of Christ's sovereignty over all, is to have fishermen in the storm rely on the carpenter. And in doing so, we come to realize that Jesus is like the title of Josh McDowell's best-selling book in defense of Christianity, Jesus is more than a carpenter.